Okay, so uh, I'll be openly honest with you about a couple of things. One, one of the reasons I'm teaching this course, um, not just because Daniel asked me if I would do it, but I'm actually, I've actually got a project in mind that I'm gonna do with this class. So y'all are kind of the guinea pigs for me going through this material because I'm thinking about it as I go through it. Um, so um, I'm hoping maybe to write something kind of around this. So just letting you know that up front. That kind of got put on my heart about several months ago. So I'm kind of, and I've had a chance to do, I told you last week, I had a chance to do some, use this a little bit in Uganda with pastors there. And in fact, when I was in Uganda, there was one young pastor that uh, um, he pulled me aside to talk to me. And now I'm actually doing some Zoom teaching with a group of pastors in Uganda. So I've got two sessions next week. And I'm going through a lot of this kind of material with them, helping them to understand it in the sense of their calling as pastors. So it's been a, a great joy. But kind of just along the way, these last several months, I've started thinking about um, trying to put this in a format that, that would be available for, and not just pastors, but for church members. So, uh, so you're helping me <laughs> as I'm working through this. No, not at all. Yeah. Well, so. <laughs> so my other confession is this night's going to be just a little bit deeper. Um, well, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. That's because we're going to do a, an overview of some material that we're going to go into more detail along the way. So we're doing kind of a flyby. Um, but I promise you uh, that um, I have practical implications for this. So we'll get to those towards the end, but I'm just giving you a heads up so please about back. that. Please, yeah, please come back. Um, no test. I think you'll be. I've heard bits and pieces of this through our marriage, and I think you'll be surprised at how much you really know. You just didn't know you knew it. Yeah. So, so let me give you a, uh, an illustration uh, that'll perhaps help with that. Um, I remember when I got my first smartphone um, and didn't really know a whole lot about how to navigate it except to make phone calls. Um, and then along the way, people would show me, oh, you can get this app to do this. Oh, you can get this app to do that. And I, um, I used to be a technology guy back in my former career, but all that knowledge has passed me by with where technology is now. So with most things like this, I have to ask somebody for help. And the other area in our house that I don't get to touch is our tools. Um, my wife owns all the tools. <laughs> if I try and use one, I'm going to do it wrong. I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to break something. Hurt so, <laughs> yeah. So um, with areas like that beyond reading books, I need a lot of help to understand what's going on. She'll start talking about a project and my eyes just glaze over. Perry will start talking about a project on the campus and my eyes will glaze over, even though I'm, I oversee facilities here. But thank goodness Perry's here. So, so um, that's just an illustration of what might happen tonight, but I'm gonna try and make sure it doesn't, okay? Yeah. But just know that, uh, just think about, this is like Gary with somebody telling him about a, a, a project that needs to get done. That's how I feel right now. <laughs> um, and this is entrusted with essential truths, and we're going to go through five of them. I introduced them last week on just one little slide, but we're going to kind of walk through them. And uh, as we do this, so I showed this slide last week, and this is the... Um, yeah, the, the idea of when you're thinking about something in scripture, um, thinking about the gospel, uh, you know, we look up and, and we pray as we read the scriptures. We look outside, what is the world thinking? Uh, we look around to see what's going on in our community and in the people around us. And then we also look back because we gain a lot through what people have done before. And the amazing thing is, um, when you start to look back into history, 
from the time of the apostles forward, you see this amazing thing that happens, that they are working hard um, to understand the truths of Scripture, that which has been handed down to them. They're working hard on that. And they're not only working hard, that's not just the pastors doing that. They're teaching the people because they understand how important it is for the, for the people to understand these truths. And we'll see some of the reasons for that as we go through. So with each of these uh, essentials, the five we're going to walk through, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what they mean, what they've meant consistently, and then kind of a little snapshot of through history, kind of what happened as those truths were being preserved in the face of many difficulties that the churches were facing. Because they were threatened by other beliefs. And they were having to think through, how do we answer this? We've got the truth handed down to us, but now somebody else has come up with another idea. How do we address that? Um, how do we help our people know that? How do we as a church know that? So that's what we're going to do. So uh, um, I showed you kind of three different um, sort of thoughts about this. One is, what was believed then about and what's believed now? So think of an area that you read about in the Bible or you talk about in church and just any area. Think of one. What do we believe? What was believed then about baptism? There you go. That's a good one. Baptism is good because we have in scriptures baptisms, right? The New Testament baptisms are happening. We see that. Um, and for a good bit of the early church, the way that we do baptism, um, we do baptism for believers. We do baptism by immersion. Um, and for a lot of the early church, that was the way you did it. And then some started to think about, um, gosh, what about babies? What about infants? Um, what about... Um, huh? <laughs> Yeah, um, and so um, the church actually wrestled with that, and you see that happening pretty early, where the idea of infant baptism happened. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that in a few minutes. And then there was a writing um, that was at the time of the apostles, so kind of the uh, post-Christ, but time of the apostles when they're planting churches, and there's a writing called the Didache. And the Didache is kind of a DYI on planning a church. You can think of it that way. It was written so that someone um, who hadn't had an apostle visit them, but they've got a church that's starting, they can understand what it means to, to uh, have a church going, with things they thought about in that day. And they talked about baptism. And this is fascinating. So their practice was that you did a fast two days before the baptism, the person getting baptized, and the person who's going to baptize them. And they encouraged also the church to do it, getting spiritually prepared for the baptism. And then it says that, um, of course, you want to you want to put them in in the in in water, but if you can't find uh, you know cold water, then if you can find some water, then sprinkle them or pour up. It basically said whatever water you can find, which is a reality of, of some of the places the church were getting planted in. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't have a lake they could run out to and baptize somebody or a river. Uh, water might be scarce. And so it was kind of the, just get them baptized, <laughs> whatever water you can find. So in that time, that was okay in certain places. You read it and you think, well, that's not how we do it. But that's how they were practicing it. So no, anyway. There was a thread that thought that, and um, yeah, and we won't go in too much detail, but just know that there's a lot of lot of work that went on in the early church to address what does baptism mean? How do you do it? Should infants be baptized? They started to think about that, and there was actually a a false teaching that brought that into the spotlight. The idea of infant baptism. Anyway, so there's one. Yeah. Closely related to that is the Lord's Supper. Mm hmm Yep. Um, what it meant, how we did it. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, and that changed over time as well. Uh, the significance of it, especially if you think about the Roman Catholic Church, and for them, it's it's the real body and blood of Christ. So, um, so there are things. There are all things that we see that um, that we go, okay, how did they practice it in the past in different periods of the church, and how do we practice it now? But the essentials we're going to go through, we're going to go through five of them, and they are clearly true throughout the whole history of the church, these things that we're going to walk through. This is what the church has always believed. Um, so we'll walk through those. Uh, and then what influenced doctrinal development and doctrinal change? So what the first part means is doctrinal development. Um, what it means is um, that uh, you have in Scripture, um, for example, a description of who God the Father is, who God the Son is, who Jesus is. Um, and then there's warnings in Scripture that some people will come along and teach something different. You know, Paul warns the Ephesian elders about that. Jason just preached on that uh, recently. Um, and then John, in his first letter, warns about, oh, there's those who don't believe that Christ came in the flesh. Um, the Antichrists, that Antichrist movement. saw. So you have throughout the early church, and we'll see this in a few minutes, you have throughout the early church other teachings that were not true from Scripture, and the church had to address that. And that caused them to write things that would address those heresies. So they take from Scripture and they write things that would say, this is what we believe, to address those false teachings. That's where a lot of the confessions came from, and the creeds came from, like the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Those are written to instruct believers and also to make sure that they understood this is what we believe. This is what the Bible says. So that was going on too. Um, and then uh, we have the same Bible now as they did then, the same 66 books. Um, so how did we get to where we are today in how we read it and how we understand it? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so that's the fascinating thing about when you look back into different periods of history, is you see that the true church is consistently saying the same thing about core beliefs, about essential beliefs, about these essential truths from Scripture. Yeah. Is there doctrinal development in all five of those boxes, or does it depend on the doctrine and that they might have had a bunch of development at the beginning, but not at the end, or it's been consistent and now there's doctrinal development? Um, there's on, on, I'm going to show you on each of the doctrines, there's sometimes doctrinal development. There's sometimes just um, things that are happening that need to be addressed, but it doesn't necessarily cause you to, to, to rewrite or rethink the doctrine. It's, it's reinforcing things from the past. No, no, that's wrong because this is what we've always believed. So, yeah. And I'm going to show you some examples of that in these five areas as we go through them just a little bit. Make sense? Okay, so the essential truth. We, we looked at these last week. I'm just going to run through the list real quick for you. So um, Trinity, that'll be the first one we tackle. I'll show you why in a minute. So uh, one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, each person fully God. Um, the Bible, the authority and sufficiency of Scripture. Um, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, so when he became incarnate, fully God and fully human, fully man, right? Yep. Uh, the fall, that uh, when Adam sinned, uh, the human race has fallen from that moment forward. And salvation by grace alone, grace of God, through faith alone, uh, belief in who Jesus was and what he did, uh, in Christ alone. So we'll walk through that a little bit too. So these are five we're going to look at. These are things that the church has always believed throughout history. 
Um, they came to fruition in the time of the apostles. We see them in the New Testament consistently. And this is what the church carried with them all the way through. In the face of questions, in the face of challenges. Um, but uh, I said last week this idea of sacred stewardship is every generation is getting handed the baton. And so in this baton are these essential truths, part of what they pass down. And so we would say today, these are things that we confess that we need to understand because we are passing the baton to that next generation. Um, and we're also facing things in our day that would challenge that these are true. Um, sometimes it happens inside the church. Most of the time it happens outside the church. So, all right, let's look at the first one. Essential truth number one, the Trinity. So here's a little diagram for you. Um, I think this was Millard Erickson who came up with this, theologian. But uh, um, it's hard, I'd say it's impossible to come up with a true picture of the Trinity. <laughs> One God, three persons. But this is just a diagram that's laid out. Okay, we've got Father, Son, Spirit. The Father is not the Son. The Father is not the Spirit. The Son is not the Spirit. But each are fully God. The Father is God. Son is God. Spirit is God. So just a few things I want to walk through, a few major points for this. Number one, we believe and confess and worship the one true God, one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So we can't fully understand the Trinity, but we, we believe it's true because that's how God reveals himself in the Scripture. Um, we confess this truth. Uh, so the early confessions were written um, in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th centuries. They're centered around this, centered around a confession of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Apostles' Creed, you see it. Creed of Nicaea, in the 4th century, you see it. Churches were writing their own confessions, local confessions, where they anchor on these things. And when you were ready for baptism, you were taught that creed or that local confession so that you understood what you believed about God, right? And you understood what, who the Father was and what the Son accomplished. And so that was kind of a prerequisite to being baptized because you'd memorize it you're being taught it. And so you get memorized. Um, um, you may not, again, you may not fully understand it. You're a new believer and you've learned it and you've been taught it, but maybe like me and the tools, you know, that, okay, uh, that's, a, that's a crescent wrench, right? <laughs> um, but you're learning it. Um, and there's good reasons for that. So, uh, this is significant for this reason. God progressively revealed throughout Scripture this eternal truth, eternal truth of his, of his eternal being. So this is the eternal God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. But in Scripture, he progressively makes that known. So we, because we know this about God, we can read the Old Testament and go, oh yeah, there's a there's, there's a reference to it there. Oh, yeah. There's a reference to it there. Oh, yeah. Old Testament saints, the Jews, didn't understand it until Christ came. He claims to be God the Son. He identifies himself as the Son of the Father. And people thought, that's blasphemy. That's, that, you're calling yourself God. So it's not until he comes and then promises send the Spirit that all of a sudden um, it's throughout Scripture and then and in history, but there's sneak peeks of it in the Old Testament. You can go back and say, oh yeah, there are the clues that, that confirm what we know about God. But it explodes in the New Testament. It's everywhere. Um, the revelation that God the Father 
God the Son, Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son, God the Holy Spirit, it's everywhere in the New Testament. You see it all over the place. Uh, you see it in the Gospels, you see it in the Epistles, uh, you see it in the book of Acts. Um, and that's now what uh, the church believes because it's everywhere in Scripture in the New Testament. And so that this gets handed down, this confession. Um, and, and the time just after the apostles, there's immediately heresies, false teachings that don't agree with this truth. And that generation is having to defend this truth. Um, and it's even true today. I'll show you that in a second. So that's a second thing to know. And then third, though not consciously conceived at the moment of salvation. So somebody who's just come to faith in Christ and they've been baptized, just like little Noah on Sunday. I don't think he has a clue about God being Father, Son, and Spirit. It's not a requirement that he understand that and know that. But over time, he'll learn that as you well taught. So it's not a condition of salvation uh, that you say, oh yeah, Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, one God, not a, not a requirement of salvation at all. But the truth of it is foundational to what we believe. Because this is eternally who God was, who God is, not was, is. And throughout scripture, we see this flow of this truth. And everything that happens is found, the Trinity is foundational to that. Right? I'm going to go through that a little bit more in just a minute. Um, but uh, our salvation, um, by grace, through faith in Christ, God the Father's eternal plan was for salvation. Um, God the Holy Spirit is the one Jesus said would, would co convict of the truth of the gospel, of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. And God the Son died on the cross for our sins. So the whole Trinity um, from eternity past engaged in our salvation. So everything that we confess from Scripture, the Trinity's foundational to it. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, always active in the work of God throughout all of history. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Right. And then, um, I've already mentioned this, but confessional statements and creeds were written early on are framed on God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You even see a few of them in Scripture, like Philippians 2. That's like a little confessional statement where, um, where Paul talks about how the Son took on human flesh um, and walks through a statement about the Son in context of his relationship to the Father. So you see these little statements even in Scripture. But these confessional statements and creeds were written because it was so important for the church to, to confess this truth and begin to understand it. And the more mature that you grow in Christ, right, in your faith, the more you'll be aware of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Um, so it's not simply just saying, I believe this, but experientially, in some sense, you'll grow to understand it. Because when you hear the name of Jesus, you think about God the Son who came so that he could go to the cross for my sin. God the Son, sent by God the Father. Right? At, at Jesus' baptism, God the Father, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased and the Holy Spirit down like a dove. So you get that sense of, of who they are more and more when you pay attention to Scripture. We're going to talk some more about this in a, in a couple weeks, but anyway. 
So here's a picture of history. You asked the question, did, did, uh, you know, did these things, uh, did doctrine develop over in every period of history? I'm just giving you a little snapshot, and we're going we're gonna to get into this more, but just a little snapshot for tonight. So here's the ancient church. So that's post the apostles, just after the time of the apostles, for those first few centuries. Um, and there were false teachings. So on the top, I've got the negatives and the things that were happening kind of against these beliefs, bottoms and posits. So there were f- external false teachings. Um, those that would say, no, there's just one God, or, oh, by the way, uh, that's not the true God. So all these false teachings. And then there were even internal false teachings. Remember Paul Warren, there'll be wolves that come to get the sheep. So even Inside the church, there's people teaching things that aren't true about the Trinity. Um, no, there's one God, so the Son can't be the same as God, the Father. The Son was created at some point in time. That was a teaching that came from inside the church that had to be addressed. Um, so you've got false teachings inside and outside, and what is the church doing to respond? Well, they are they're remembering that the Trinity is foundational to everything we believe. Um, we have no salvation if Christ isn't fully God, um, for example. And their, their confessions were all Trinitarian-focused because of that. God the Father, statement. God the Son, statement. God the Holy Spirit, statement. Um, Irenaeus, who is uh, a... Um, uh, a pastor in the late late second century, so around around 180 A.D., he actually said this: the first principle of our faith is God the Father. The second principle, God the Son. Third principle, God the Holy Spirit. And he from there he writes his how to understand certain things of our belief, but it's focused on that truth about the Trinity. Because nothing happens in creation history apart from the truth of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Right? And then they worked on refuting. Anytime a false teaching came up, they labored to refute it. We've got to address this. We don't want our people starting to believe this. So we've got to address that. Um, Medieval period, so this is the emergence of what will become the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, They were writing proofs for the existence of God. They're trying to apply logic and reason to philosophers to say, okay, we can we can explain why God we can explain why the incarnation happened. So they were using reason and logic to try and build a defense. Not a bad thing. Um, During the Reformation, they go back to the early church and they affirm everything that was said about God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Because guess what? Some of those same false teachings are cropping up again. There are individuals saying, no, this is not true about God. This is not true about Jesus. So they're reaffirming those things, saying, no, no, this this is what we believe. In the modern period, so this is a during the Enlightenment, so you've got philosophy and reason and science um, and experience that are claiming this is what's really true and anything supernatural is false, didn't happen. So Bible, that's just a book that some people, some people back in that day wrote to defend their faith. But that's not really true because supernatural things don't happen. Science happens, reason happens. And so the church had to address that. And so they worked on their confession language, again, just like the early church, to be able to, uh, to uh, explain biblically their faith against the false teachings in that day, which, by the way, have carried on into the present. Um, and then in the present, um, it became less important in churches to to talk about the Trinity, to teach the Trinity, uh, to explain that, to even, even do a confession about the, the Trinity. And so there was less, less interest in confessing it and teaching it. Uh, we all grew up, at least I did, in that period. When I joined the Catholic Church, I was the first Catholic to 
I'm a Methodist. Yeah. 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 Well, I had a I had a student in one of my classes a couple of semesters ago, and it was a class on the Trinity, um, and uh, so she sent me a note before the class started um, and said, "I asked my pastor about it, and my pastor couldn't explain it," and I thought, "Oh, well, <laughs> what do I do?" <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, Well, I think, but I think one thing probably that, and that may have been true. Uh, they may not have been well trained in it. They may, you know, but I think another reason is simply because not understanding that it's foundational to everything we believe. Um, if you if you understand that that um, the Trinity is foundational to everything we believe, then it matters that you teach it, that you preach it, that you listen when people are praying about it and say, oh, wait a minute, that person just started with God the Father and then said, thank you for dying on the cross for me. No, that's not right. <laughs> it's Jesus, God the Son, who died on the cross. So um, anyway, yeah. <laughs> well, I wouldn't uh, yeah, I wouldn't quite agree with the first half understanding because, but but believe it. Now that's a problem because I can, you can believe it and not understand. I I admit that you know I've studied I've studied this for a long time and taught class on it and I still get the fourth fourth down at punt because it's impossible to comprehend God. One so God, three persons. Yeah. <laughs> explaining why they baptize in the name of Jesus instead of the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what they said is the name of the Father is Jesus, the name of the Son is Jesus, and the name of the Holy Spirit is Jesus, so you baptize Jesus. Yeah. And I've yeah. all guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, my wife showed me this week, um, and... Uh, um, I was going to work out, do this when we actually do the longer lesson on the Trinity, but there is a um, there's a creed called the Sparkle Creed. Sparkle. Sparkle Creed. Sparkle. Yeah. Sparkle. Well, s sort of. Um, I, I didn't. That's what I thought too when my wife mentioned it to me. Um, if you get a chance, I don't know you, were showing me this. you did. Yeah, it was a few days ago. Yeah. If you get a chance. Uh -oh. Go look at it. It's uh, go listen to it. It's horrible. It's really sad. Um, yeah. Why you say we don't have to believe in the Trinity? You have to No, believe in the Trinity, understand it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Believe. In fact, I said up front believe, confess, worship. A child doesn't have to understand it. Well, that's true. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. God, yeah. But you may not understand the concept. Well, nobody does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and not my favorite quotes was Chuck Swindoll saying, if he could truly understand the Trinity, there'd be four persons to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's, okay. and that, that's a good point. Right. Yeah. Okay. I used to. Well, and that, the that's the problem. Right? even as pastors trying to explain it is we're trying to explain an infinite concept with a finite mind yeah. Yeah. and it doesn't work too well sometimes you yeah. give all kind of analysis but, the trees well, and leaves and the trunks and root trees yeah. 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 but, but just yeah but just know again uh, yeah this is this is a this is a, a belief this is a, a truth that the church has always believed it's in scripture um, you know, the Lord very intentional in in how throughout history um, He revealed Himself. When Christ comes, it's boom. Okay, now here's the Son in human flesh. What does John John say about Him in John one? Um, 
that, uh, that no one has seen God at any time, but the Son of God, He revealed Him. He displays Him. And John says that after coming to understand, because remember, John walked with Jesus. And only over time did John come to an understanding, oh my gosh, this is what he means that he's been saying he's son of the Father. This is what it means that he's truly God. Um, and it's giving that little, um, the intro to his gospel. So you have in Genesis, in the beginning, Elohim. Here's John, John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Son. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, the Father. So John starts out, you got to know this. Um, anyway, so. Um, well, I used to think that it's so difficult to understand. I just wasn't going to try. And Gary really has encouraged me over a lot of years of marriage to, to wrestle with it and to try to understand yeah. better and to grow in that understanding and to show our kids that it's okay to wrestle with it. And it's important to wrestle with it because if a whole generation stops wrestling, then it gets lost. Yeah. And nobody is teaching it. Anymore. But but big idea um, is we want to glorify God and make Him known. And so glorifying God and making Him known means we seek to know more about who He is. Right? Okay. Uh, got four more, and I got to keep moving. <laughs> We're, yeah, we're going to spend more time. Yeah, and we'll spend more time on these things. Okay, number two, the scriptures, the Bible. So a few thoughts about this. Uh, human writing, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's not man-created truth, but eternal divine truth. Eternal divine truth, which means the scripture is God's word, though written by human authors, um, and it's eternal divine truth. So think about even as they were writing, not having a full understanding of what they're writing, because prophecy unfolds over time. Um, so eternal divine truth. Um, and... Um, I'm going to show you this in some more detail when we spend the week, a week on the scriptures. But So there's a grand narrative of scripture, an overarching narrative for scripture that reveals who God is. We talked a little bit about that already. Reveals God's eternal plan. Remember, there's no, uh oh, I didn't think about this. As history's unfolding and God's plan's unfolding, it's his eternal divine plan, which will be fulfilled in all its completion, and in history, an unfolding of that plan, the nature of his plan and the accomplishment of his plan. So slowly, there's a grasp of, oh, this is what he intended to do. Um, even when he announces beforehand about something that's going to happen in a few hundred years, there's still the, oh, that's what he meant. And when Christ shows up, even though that's prophesied many places. Oh, that's what he meant. That's what that means. So there's this unfolding of his plan, a grand narrative. Um, Trinitarian, because that's the basic of everything, basis of everything, right? It's Trinitarian, creation, redemption, narrative. So I'll kind of show you what that means when we get to that point. Um, but it makes it easier to, with Christ at the center, Christ is the center. So um, he, um, because of his, his incarnation, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his coming back, he becomes a center of the whole grand narrative for, for what um, God the Father intended for him, how he accomplished it. And we live in that age where we can go, oh, yeah. Unlike the Old Testament prophets who couldn't look ahead and say, well, that's how it's going to happen. We get, we get the pleasure of looking back. Oh, yeah. Although we haven't seen yet the return. So, um, 
progressively written and revealed to be the complete closed canon, we confess that these are the 66 books. These are the ones that, are, uh, that are, were inspired by the Holy Spirit for men to write. This is it. Um, there's no new revelation that somebody's giving to say, oh yeah, God said, and so we add it to this with what that person said and write it down. We'll explain that more. And then interpretation happens. Uh, and Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians. Interpretation, as we study the Bible, through God the Holy Spirit, because uh, Paul was saying Corinthians that he's the one that reveals uh, as we read scripture. He's the one that reveals truth to us. The, the non-believer can't understand no matter how wise they say they are. Um, to ascertain the unchanging truths unfolding in history and in progressive expression. So throughout the Bible, you have expanded expression of who God is, of what his plan is, of the accomplishment of his plan. And there's a phrase that was, that was coined um, uh, quite a while ago in history, but it's faith-seeking understanding. So we believe, because this is God's eternal truth, we believe it's true, and we're seeking to better understand God's word. It's not the reverse. It's not we start and say, well, okay, I'm going to apply reason to this book and have them prove it to me that this is true. It's not understanding seeking faith. It's faith seeking understanding. So, and then it's completely and infallibly sufficient for the church. There are many things that we'd like to know that aren't in this book. In fact, Paul warns Timothy in his letters, hey, people will get uh, caught up in these myths and genealogies and things like that. Waste of time. He says to Timothy, focus on Christ, focus on the gospel, focus on what God has revealed in his word. That's all we need to know. Yeah. And there's lots of great, there's lots of great things that people have done in science and, and medicine and all kinds of things. And that's all well and good. But this isn't, you know, a book about medicine. Um, this is not a book that tells you how everything in the world works. It's a book focused on God's plan, who God is, um, accomplishment of God's plan, and things that we need to know to be able to walk as faithful followers of, of Christ. So throughout history, and I'll just look at the, the beginning period. I won't spend a lot of time on this because we're going we're gonna to spend more time on We're going to do a whole week on, on the scriptures. But uh, there were, to the negative, there were competing ideas of what, they, what, what should be in the books. In fact, there was one particular uh, individual who decided most of these books don't belong. So, uh, especially New Testament. So I'm going to rip that apart. I'll leave this, these little pieces in there. That's really what's true. Um, there were competing gospels and epistles. So a gospel of Thomas, which, uh, which uh, repudiated what's in the four gospels. Um, there were people writing letters saying, oh yeah, this was from Barnabas or this was from so-and-so. And, and they had false teachings in them, and, but some people claiming that they were, no, that should be in the Bible. Um, and prophetic additions. So there were some who uh, in the early church, and this still happens today, who, who will say, but God said, as if they're an Old Testament prophet or a New Testament prophet. No, this is, this, this is, this God says, um, well, you better be proven right because what you're saying is I'm adding to the Bible. And so that happened in the early church, it still happens today where people said, God says, which isn't just a, I heard this about you, um, but it's a, this is something that's not in scripture, but it should be. That's what they're, that's what they're intending to mean. Yeah. But it was real serious in the early church because 
Um, the uh, the canon is being recognized. Um, the early the early uh, writers and thinkers they're using all the books, um, but it's just being recognized. And so others say, no, no, this this is this is God's word. This is God's word. This is God's word. And disagreed with what was in the scripture, particularly New Testament um, gospels and epistles. So, um, so they adopted the canon. They came to a, an agreement that, no, no, those are the 66 books. That's, that's it. Um, and this thing called the regular fide or the rule of faith, rule of truth, where if a strange teaching were coming up, uh, they would say, well, no, this is what's in the scripture. And we know how to interpret that because we were taught by the apostles. So they were passing down this way in which the apostles taught the scripture to preserve truths about the scripture and the way to read the scripture. Because others could read the scriptures and find things that they'd say, oh, well, that means this. Uh, like the idea that Jesus was created. Um, no. So um, during the medieval period, uh, there's a gradual elevation of tradition. Um, so um, tradition that was, that was uh, from an, an interpretation of scripture that became on an equal plane with the scriptures. So you had not scriptures over uh, the way in which things were interpreted in practice, but these things equal with scripture. Um, and then in the Reformation period, um, it was impossible for the average person to have a Bible and, and be able to read it. it. wasn't available. You'd only go to, you know, to uh, to the uh, the church and you'd go to mass and it would be read to you and it'd be read in Latin. So if you didn't know Latin, you were out of luck. Um, Martin Luther, um, he didn't have access to the scriptures until the time of the Reformation, and he got a German Bible and read that, and he finally understood. That's where he came to the realization that, oh gosh, they're not teaching the true gospel. Um, when he first had a chance to read the scripture, that's how he discovered that. He had a sense of it, but it's, hey, wait a minute. Um, yeah, uh, faith, you know, um, by grace through faith, not works. You know, he's... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's, started to become accessible, but it was inaccessible to most. And this was also the time when, when the Pope was declared to be what he said was infallible, right? So the Pope could say something that wasn't in scripture, but that was the infallible, infallible because he was the one appointed by God to be able to do that, the only one, um, and that came about. On the good side, you've got, finally, the church able to read and study the Bible. Um, finally, uh, those who broke away from the Catholic Church who could do that and address the issues that were going on in the, in the Roman Church. And then you've also had the beginning of the Bible becoming accessible to the masses and starting to get translated in other languages so people could read it and have access to it. Major, major breakthrough for that. Uh, in the modern period, you have um, many things happening. You've got a redefinition of truth. Um, so you get to today where people would say, well, my truth is my truth. Um, there's not one absolute truth, right? That claim happened. A rejection, re a rejection of historicity. So uh, this is not really what happened in history. Uh, things in the Bible, but no, uh, because it's called these supernatural things and other things in it to say, no, that's, that's not a true history. And so the eclipse of the Bible through that began to happen. And you've got biblical studies moving to universities. And so universities are challenging. Um, they're reading it as a, as a study book, not as the Bible, not as a book of faith. But a Bible to be, uh, but a book to be critically examined and dissected, and change where necessary, or th or pieces thrown out where necessary. On the good side, you've got a stronger focus on the fundamentals and the essentials, and great defense of the truth of Scripture from the church. 
Um, but churches were splitting too. C certain denominations moving away or certain churches breaking away because they're paying more attention to science and reason and other things and departing from just the pure teaching of the scriptures. All right. Oh, and I put a little quote up there from uh, from uh, Second Peter. Uh, no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Scripture provides its own defense of Scripture being God-breathed, not humanly alone written. So it's just like any other book to be critiqued. Number three, the incarnate Son. Move just a little bit faster. So Jesus Christ, God the Son. One person, two natures. So you've got one God and three persons. When Jesus became incarnate, you've got one person with two natures, divine and human. Um, that reality bothered a lot of people to confess that. But here are the big facts. God the Son eternally exists in the Godhead. So he was eternal with the Father. Eternally God the Son to God the Father. God the Father is always a father to God the Son. Um, some didn't believe that, were, that was true. Um, at the historical moment of the incarnation, so this happened, this really happened in history. At the moment of the incarnation, God, God the Son took on a human nature. So at that moment, when the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, at that moment, you have full, fully God, fully human. At that moment. Before that, it was just fully God. Just fully God, yeah. And he still incarnate, still God, God the Son in human flesh. Still. I explain that he's the only 200% that's ever been. 100% human and 100% God. Yeah. 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 And the union didn't change either nature, so his deity didn't affect his humanity nor the reverse, right? Um, he's two complete, as you said, 100% natures, um, which makes it interesting when you start thinking about that as you read through the Gospels, as you read about him, uh, because you can go, well, sometimes it seems like he's, this is, this is Jesus the human, right? So his, his deity's gone to sleep, or vice versa. Um, and Augustine actually did a little work on that to help. He provides some uh, some tools to help you be able to read passages and, and understand them better. But for me, it's just amazing to to read them and think about John and John's realization and go, okay, he's speaking here, he's doing this, he's saying that, he's, um, but he's still fully God and fully man at the same time. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, but he's still fully God, fully man. And Colossians says that uh, God the Son, through whom things were created, that's John 1, is sustaining the world. So you think about, oh my gosh, it's amazing to think that when he's walking the earth, he's still sustaining the world, all of creation. It's incredible to think about that. Um, so... Among all the glorious revelations and truth of the Incarnation, so the more that you read the Gospels and think about um, the incarnate Son of God, the more you can go, oh my gosh, this is just amazing. There's so many things that you could, you could think about. But the central accomplishments are his death, his resurrection, his promised return, because that's the hope of fallen humanity those things. Um, and uh, um, you look at the cross and what he accomplished um, and think about that. They took on the sins of the world on the cross. Um, yeah. Okay, so... Um, in the ancient period, there's a defense of his full deity and his two natures, uh, because there were denials of that by all kinds of different people, all kinds of different, different heresies that were spotted around, denying this is true about Christ. But they were rooted in 
um, one, his, his eternal existence, their confession of him being fully God from all eternity, but also the plan of salvation. Um, so they thought about expressing the gospel in terms of who Christ is, fully God and fully man. There's a writing called On the Incarnation, which is written during the time when there was denial that Christ was fully God. Um, and it's beautiful because it's written with a gospel thought to it to explain the incarnation based on there was no other way for our salvation but that the Son of God took on human flesh. Um, and it's, it's brilliant and beautiful to read that and think that's what they're thinking about. They're not just trying to say he's fully God and fully man. They're saying this is what our salvation is based on. This is what the whole God's whole plan of history was based on. It's his taking on human flesh, his dying on the cross for us, being resurrected and coming back. It's amazing. Um, we can go, we'll go through the other ones when we get to, get to him. But uh, The fall. Okay. Adam's sin resulted in a sin nature. You heard what about that tonight? All humanity conceived in sin with this sin nature, accepting Jesus Christ. He's the only one. So he took on human flesh, but the only one who took on human flesh without a sin nature. Um, and the scriptures bear witness to this condition of the human race in both narrative, in poetry, you read about it in the Psalms, uh, and in the epistles where you see these theological expressions um, that um, there is no one righteous, no, not one, um, for example. And the only hope for redemption and restoration to fellowship with God was accomplished. The only hope was what happened when Christ sacrificed himself on the cross, being a sinless substitute for us. Because there was no sin in him. And only a sinless sacrifice could pay for our sins, and only being fully God could he take on all the sins of everyone, right? Fully God, fully human. Um, so there is an agreement in the early church on depravity, on the depravity of humanity, and it's fueled by their understanding what they knew from scriptures and what they were taught uh, about God's plan of salvation. No, but no one was denying in the church that, that we're not fully, fully depraved or that, we're, that we have this sin nature. Although some, um, so this is happening you know, by those who are, uh, don't agree with who, who Christ was, uh, a denial of a physical redemption that, that had to happen that we had to be physically saved because there's no way, the world is so bad, there's no way that, that a deity would come and get into the world, otherwise they'd get messed up. So there's denial of that, even the need for it, and denial of a sin nature. Some denied that. Some said that you were born innocent, and it's only when you sinned that you became a sinner. And it's possible that you could live your whole life. He said, I've never met anybody that could do that. But if you lived your whole life, you could not need what Christ did on the cross. So that was, no. Um, and then in the, during the Middle Ages. But then in the Middle Ages, so, um, and this, this was finally affirmed by the Roman church at the Council of Trent in the 16th century. They said that when you were baptized, um, that original sin was remitted from you. So you were cured of original sin, but you still had the incentive to sin or an inclination to sin. Um, okay, say that again. Baptized, you were what? Uh, 
Yeah. yeah. So it was remitted. You didn't have original sin anymore. Um, yeah. And that was a response to. Yeah. Right. They called it concupiscence is the technical term. Still that inclination to sin. Um, and so you still had to go to confession to do all those things. But original sin was removed. Um, yeah. In the modern period, of course, there's denial of the idea that everyone is depraved, that everyone is in sin. Denial that that's true for all humanity. Um, and a focus on the gospel being more for curing things in society than personal. Uh, the social gospel emerged, and they said, what we really need to do is take care of the poor, um, take care of, of those that are in need. That's, that's the true gospel. Um, and the idea of a you know, personal trust in Christ didn't matter as much as we need to take care of the ills that are in, in, in the world. So that came out. All right, finally, number five, salvation. So we've Trinity, um, foundation of everything that we believe. The Bible, we talked about uh, Christ and his incarnation. We talked about the fall, salvation. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. What does that mean? Well, here's the big idea is we're going to spend a couple of weeks actually talking about the gospel. Um, but grace alone, God's eternal plan for salvation is sovereign, is secure, is uncontested. It's personal, but not compromised by it being personal, right? Because everybody's got their own story of how they came to faith in Christ. And God truly knows how that happened. <laughs> Even the individual doesn't know exactly how that happened. Um, Gracious and just, so he's, he's, he's gracious to grant salvation, but he's also just, um, and that's proven through the cross. Uh, and that prompts deep consideration and unwavering trust in his, at times, unfathomable ways. Um, so, for example, if you were at night of prayer, you heard, Pastor Chad talk about his brother um, who's not saved um, and how um, he's been praying for him. None of us know um, because it's the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, who will come and convict the world of sin, righteous judgment. Hearing the gospel makes it happen, but, um, but uh, we don't know when and how and where that someone might come to faith in Christ might be saved. But from eternity past, God's plan's been there for that to happen. So there's not, not, a, um, not a change in the program that's gonna happen from the divine point of view from eternity past. He knew that there would be sin. He, he had an eternal plan for the salvation of, of those who will be saved. Um, and then faith alone, faith, not reasoning your way to, to believe in Christ, not adding something on uh, once you're saved. And it's the mysterious work of the Holy Spirit that is humanly unmanageable and unpredictable. <laughs> in other words, we can't persuade someone to be saved. Uh, we can't do that. We can't try and control when that's going to happen or if that's going to happen. That's the word of the Holy Spirit, which also is great relief for us, even though we're greatly disturbed by people that we know are lost and need the gospel. I have a friend who says that because the Holy Spirit is not humanly manageable, that no one can deny Christ if he chooses them. So he's saying that only certain people are chosen, therefore only certain people are going to be saved. The rest of them are just out of love or out of blessing. Yeah. You know, I've had these discussions. Yeah. Well, um, we are called to, to proclaim the gospel. We have no excuse to say, you know what? That's in God's court. I don't need to do anything about it. So, um, but we'll talk more about that when we, when we hit the gospel. Then finally, Christ alone. The accomplishment of the incarnate Son of God in history when he went, when he gave his life on the cross. Plan from all eternity is complete. 
complete. Nothing else needs to be done. He's not going to die again. Um, he's, it's not going to be, oh yeah, I've got to add some works to this to be saved. Not going to happen like that. And uh, here's a picture of, of kind of how that's been maintained throughout the centuries. I'll just look at the plus side real quick. Salvation is central to the scriptures by Christ. And salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. In the Reformation, they spent a lot of time addressing that in response to what, was ha what had happened in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and so um, there's beautiful passages in Scripture that affirm this to be true. And last week I gave you marks of the true church. So what we've gone through hits some of those important marks of the true church. We're oriented to the glory of God, the triune God. Bring Him glory when gathered and when not. We're focused on the Word of God, the Bible, um, and we're focused on Christ, the big W word, right? Convicted, gathered, gifted, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We'll talk more about that. And we're united as believers by a personal confession that we have, but also by a common confession. We've talked about some of the confessional language and confessional work that was done. But we have a common confession about who God is, about all these truths, about what God is accomplishing in His eternal plan. And we are called to proclaim the gospel and advance the kingdom of God. So I'll just give you thoughts to leave with. Uh, how do these truths encourage you? How do they encourage you? And then what's difficult to understand? If you want to think about that, because we're going to come back through these in a bigger picture, right? If you want to think about that, you can. All right, well, running late again. Thank you for your time. Hopefully this wasn't too far up there. <laughs> yeah.